here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastor. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of the bass player, Prescott Niles, who was in The Knack. And um, they obviously had the massive single from 1979, My Sharona. But in April 2022, they will be unveiling a previously unreleased 2001 concert which is titled Live at the House of Blues. This was recorded in Hollywood. This is an 18-track um, album that's going to appear as a double LP gatefold set, which is going to be pressed on baby blue vinyl. So there you go. So there's only going to be 2,500 copies available worldwide. And also there's going to be CD and digital release as well, which is going to be in May. Anyway, that's far too much detail. This is the interview with Prescott and... Um, is an amazing character so do do take notes because it's quite engaging i say so myself anyway we got down to that very exciting subject that was the early formative years prescott take it away you will be so happy to know i lived in england from 73 to 75 oh wow that's um, that's, and that that was that was the peak of everything you just described Yes, it was. It was. It was the good, the bad, and the slightly tacky. At no, times. And, and I had no idea that this later to be an, uh, our producer Mike Chapman was riding the wave of immense success during those years. You know, yes, with all was. the groups you mentioned, he was, and, he was uh, the kind of go-to man, wasn't he? Actually, so so what? Was, so what made you, or what sort of gave you the moment to be in England during those kind of well, years? I was. Um, We'll get back to some of the, well, I was playing with the Velvet Turner group, which fell apart. The Hendrix uh, alleged, you know, the new Hendrix allegedly, which we can get into later. I got a chance to go to Boston for a few months. But while I was there, my lead guitarist, a guitar player I knew in L.A., found an English backer who believed in his talent and wanted to take him back to England. So uh, he called me in Boston and we flew to England together April 1st of 73. And we are actually our manager was uh, Stuart Granger's son, Jamie Granger. Right. And his girlfriend, Julian Bavaroff, ran Bobton's model agency. And you know that was the best time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Sir Michael Pearson was involved on the executive end. Right. Believe it or not. So that was my entry into, well, I had been in London before. That was my entry back into London. And uh, it was fascinating to be there. So I was in a group called uh, Hollywood, it was called. And we played around for a while. So that's what got me to England to be to live there. And we had the backing. And well, first, I uh, before we got the money sent, you know, before we got the money, I was staying with somebody in Notting Hill for a little while. Then I moved to um, what's that wonderful play? Earl's Court. Right. We, we you can always smell fine food blowing in the wind. <laughs> And I didn't know about Indian food or I grew up in New York, so I had no idea what that was about. And then I moved to uh, King, uh, World's End in Fulham, right in, near that famous pub. I used yeah. to go to the Chelsea Potter, by the way, which is great back in the day. And also uh, then after that, stayed in Chelsea for a short time, which I loved. And then we got a house out in Sussex near East Grinstead in Crawley. Blimey, that's that's quite a lot. And this was kind of all done in your late teens. So was this with the Velvet Turner Band? Was this the band? Well, Velvet Turner, Velvet Turner Group had broken up. That that freed me to go to Boston. And then the chance to go to England was something I couldn't have dreamed of, really, to go there and live there. And yes. then, of course, in, in Crawley, the town of Crawley, me and, my, me and Jeffrey were known as the Americans. Well, why? Because nobody knew nobody knew why we were there, why we looked the way we did. We took taxis and and everything, but you know, you know, how people used to whisper back then, they're the Americans. Yes. And um, I guess we had parties. And, and one great thing I will share with you, because we lived near Gatwick Airport, we were able to party all night in London, go to Victoria Station, take the train to Gatwick, and then take a cab home. So that was a great, great uh, period in London. Uh, by the way, I, I'm a big Bowie fan, Excellent. and I saw I saw the concert at Santa Monica Civic 
which became a live album that was released later on. So that was amazing. When I moved to London, I saw Bowie's last concert. If you can believe that. So this was when he did his, this is the last time we'll play live. Yeah, and I, it's when Jeff Beck jammed. And I couldn't believe that within a year plus, I'm seeing a first LA concert and the last concert. It, it was not the last, but he announced the end of Ziggy. Yeah. So that was quite remarkable, if you, if you know my perspective on that one. Yes, absolutely. Because a couple of but, uh, last year, ahead, I'm sorry. I did an interview with a guy called Roger Mayhew, who was the sound engineer who had been in sort of various 60s bands. Oh, there was a band, I think, called The Presidents, and he, they went nowhere fast. But then, you know, Angie Bowie sort of tapped him on the shoulder one night and said, look, you, you, you can get a good sound and we can't get a good sound for Ziggy. Can you sort of do this gig for us? And he was on the road for two years doing Ziggy Stardust. So um, there you go. A bit of bit he was of... he was remo- he was brilliant. I knew that show was memorable. There's a lot of people I I kind of knew that was part of Bowie's entourage as well. Uh, I re- I remembered that show and of course the after party, which we can get into later because I knew a lot of people from New York. I used to go to uh, uh, Max's Kansas City all the time, and I also go to Warhol parties when right. I was 18. And that's a fascinating period to be culturally. Uh, I guess one could call it progressive by today's terms. But well, back then it was just, yeah, God, I'm sorry, it was the arts community. And I didn't care what people called anything. It was just fascinating. I would imagine it was very fascinating because I suppose you had CBGB's Max's Kansas City and then the Mud Club a bit later. But yes, obviously Max's. But you, you, also, you also came across, because I did an interview with um, Jay... Jay French, was it JJ French uh-huh. from Twisted Sister, who sort of gave me a bit of an overview of this sort of the New York rock scene and talked about the Steve, Steve Pools, the scene, which was quite another amazing club in New York, wasn't it? I, I used to go there and I'll tell you why, but keep going because you're yes. going to have to help me navigate because I got a lot of info <laughs> apart from the knack. But if you're interested, um, you know, I can draw the, the chronological lines between Velvet him and then going to England and all the people I met there. However you want to do it, I'm just letting you know, I'd love to go along with you want to go. Yeah, okay then. So just roughly then, so you you were sort of born probably a decade before me, but so what, how, what, what was your 60s period and where did you grow up in the 60s? Well, I grew up in Brooklyn, which is a good place to grow up. And, you know, I can get to Manhattan pretty, pretty easily, great uh, train system there but i remember uh i originally was growing up i I loved music i listened to radio a lot obviously and motown started to become prominent radio of course the beatles were big influenced to myself and you know every every young (laughs) wannabe musician who saw the beatles on that famous night in history all of a sudden wanted to play guitar now i wanted to play guitar before that because of the beach boys and the ventures and people that I heard and thought they were incredible. And I kind of waited a little bit because I also had great skills as a baseball player. And I actually thought I'd someday be a baseball player. Yes. But as fate would have it, I dropped the ball and played bass. <laughs> another, another way yeah. to look at it. That's, that's, a good, that's a good way to look at it. And were your parents of a musical background or did they have any interest in, in the arts? Uh, not specifically, but they liked to go dancing. And my mom loved pop radio right? and she loved the Beatles. She was very, I don't want to use the word liberal. That's a strange word. She was really free. She loved dancing. She loved clothing. I mean, I love the fact when I was 17 and I couldn't get English clothes anywhere. She'd take me to women's stores to get boots <laughs> and shirts because nobody in Brooklyn was buying anything that looked remotely like English. So my mom was really cool. And my, my dad was, was great. He was supportive. Didn't understand why I gave it a baseball scholarship, but I told yes. him that I'm I'm going to make it in the big time one day, and well, he believed me. And it does sound like your mum was quite liberal or bohemian. They yeah, both of. were, but in her own, yeah, she was more artsy and cared more about clothing and fashion. And uh, she was again, she was cool because she understood maybe more so than a lot of moms in Brooklyn, kind of where I was going with it. Yes. And, uh, also, she got me a modeling gig at uh, Abraham and Strauss, which was a big department store in New York. Nice. But after a couple of shows and realizing I could make $100 pretty quick, I realized there were probably other costs to pay to 
to continue working. And I wasn't that friendly to begin with. Mm-hmm. And maybe I was a bit too squared or maybe fully, fully uh, engaged the culture. But it was kind of cool in a way, if, if you know where I'm going with that. Yes, and, absolutely. And uh, it, it, it got me out there a little bit. So even though I was kind of living in a straight world, the, the first show I actually saw was in Brooklyn. It was at the RKO Theater. They used to have like rock shows. So one of the first shows I saw at 15 with Steve, Little Stevie Wonder opened. You know, they walked him out, dark glasses, and he did fingertips. That was his hit then. Right. That was followed by the Ronettes. Blimey, cheesy, crazy. And I got it, and I got a crush. Not I would because imagine. of the bee, not because of the beehives only, but, <laughs> but uh, they were gorgeous. And I think the Dovells, who had a big hit called Bristol Stomp, right. was out. So that was one of the first shows I saw. Uh, let's say in Brooklyn, there was something called the Anderson Theater that preceded the Fillmore. Yeah. So I my one of my first shows because I was a big Yardsbirds fan. So I actually saw Jimmy Page with the Yardbirds, which became a live album that came out years later. Blimey, there you go. And was was it Jim McCarty? He was the yes, drummer. that was it, great drummer. It? Yes, and, and he still, still plays with them. He still plays with them. I did an interview he's, with him a few years ago. Good old Jim. He's wonderful. He had wonderful a solo guy. Album. Yeah, such a sort of humble bloke, actually, for such a sort of musical moment. But then as the 60s progressed, you would have been, you would have started being aware of like the first Beatles album, just about. But then you'd have started to sort of go, oh, look, 67, Summer of Love. Um, Yes. And then, you know, like suddenly the Beatles brought out Sgt. Pepper. But then, you know, there were were the Doors, Jimi Hendrix, Jefferson Airplane. Was was that all that, was that music all starting to sort of... Well, I went to the, I was lucky... I was so lucky to go to the University of Fillmore, East and West. Bill Graham was the greatest influence for rock and roll. Uh, When I started going to, after I saw the Yardbirds, then Bill Graham changed that and and started Fillmore. At that time, my favorite group was The Who. Not only because John Ambrose was somebody I aspired to play like, which was really well above my means at the time, but I saw them a year later because I can see for miles it's one of my favorite songs. Yes. And because the way Fillmore ran their shows was they always have a blues artist or, or acoustic, uh, you know, folk singer, and then they'd have a great band. So every show I went to was was an experience because I was exposed to so much music, whether it was Faircourt Convention, the Incredible String Band, uh, probably Donovan played there, Tim Harden played there. I mean, you name it. Plus, they had Albert King, B.B. King. Uh, so it was It was really, I, I started to understand all the different styles of music that I probably wouldn't hear on the radio. Mm. Uh, one of the first big band besides American band was, believe it or not, Jefferson Airplane. Because seeing Grace Slick in a mini was pretty cool at 17. I would imagine. And, um, and, and Jack Cassidy had a big influence in my bass playing, the way he sounded. And a lot of people don't mention him very much, but he was one of the premier bass players. To yes. me, at the time, along with John Ann Whistle and uh, a lot of notables to be followed after that. So Fillmore was an amazing place. And I saw Hendrix, by the way, in 68 at Fillmore. God, and that... that started my journey on this is the way to go. There's no turning back at this point. Yeah. And did you? when did you first think from going from being just listening and going to lots of gigs to thinking I'm going to get a bass or get, get a guitar and be... But, um, you know, be a, in a band. Well, my my big motivation was, uh, you know, after I, I drove cross country with my parents, I don't remember any of it, but we drove to California. And it was all a different world seeing the music out there, seeing the, the vibe. It was like a color world. It, it, all of a sudden, black and white was New York. California mm. was c- color in terms of like a, a movie, you know. And of course, Jim R. Uh, uh, Light My Fire, I heard leaving New York. And when I got to California, you're still hearing that song. <laughs> and you had no idea what a big influence it had. Uh, at that time, as well as all the other, everything on the radio, the Beatles, I loved, the Stones, I loved. I mean, look at all those groups that were different, but similar to each other. Yes. It wasn't just one. And I loved The Who. I loved The Move. A lot of people don't know who they were. Uh, I mean, I saw everybody. So in a way, it gave me a real. Uh, it kind of encyclopedia of all the styles and all the personas. And it was, it was, fa- it was fabulous. 
Um, I, pr- I probably should mention Delbert Turner at this point, if I may. <laughs> you should, Only yes. because, so on, this is, get my water. So this is Jimi Hendrix. He's kind of, um, he influenced this band. Mm-hmm. Well, Velvet, I was playing in a group in Brooklyn, a blues group, yes. and Velvet came by one day to audition as a lead singer. Somebody mentioned him. He looked very much like Jimmy, except he was 6'3", but he hunched over like Jimmy when he walked. If you, it was funny how Velvet copied a lot of his moves, but after we played, I said, hey, you know, where do you get the clothes? I mean, I've never seen anybody in Brooklyn dressed like that. And he said, well, he went shopping with Jimmy. I go, Jimmy who? He said, Jimmy Hendrix. And I go, no way. You know, I'm from Brooklyn going, what are you talking about? Nobody knows Jimi Hendrix, you know? And he said, no, uh, I met him and, you know, and we should keep in touch. You know, he went to concerts. So about six months later, uh, I called him a couple of times. He invited me to go to a concert to see Jimmy at Philharmonic Hall mm. in Manhattan, which is, a, and then he said, we'll go to his birthday party afterwards. And I thought, this guy's nuts, <laughs> of course. So uh, I, I got there. I went to see the show. It was, it was incredible. It was a you know a, a, a classical hall, and the acoustics were incredible. Jimmy was amazing. I had seen him as I mentioned about a number of months earlier, so I kind of knew what to expect. But with Jimmy, he never played the same song, the song twice the same way. Because mm. a lot, like a lot of the great groups, Yardbirds, the Who, they always improvised, and I mean uh, Led Zeppelin rather. The, the impro- improvisational aspect of it was so important. Because, you know, a lot of groups play the songs note for note. And, you know, the knack even to a degree when you know songs, you can't change them. But these guys would just jam. And the jamming was exciting. Because yes. you never knew what was going to happen in any given night. You mm. could see them nine times and, and still it wouldn't be the same show. Amazing. And that, was, that taught me more about the gift of improvisation, which I think is missing in today's world. Yeah, but I'll, I'll digress. So anyway, after the concert, lo and behold, we went uptown to the Cheetah Club and it was Jimmy's birthday party and in the full bar and I'm standing 10 feet away, speechless, going, how did this happen? You know, how did, how did this, how do I get here? I didn't say a word, but because Velvet knowing Jimmy and people knew he knew Jimmy, I, I all of a sudden, instead of being in the audience, I started going backstage. Right. And, when, and what you alluded to earlier, that was another aspect of me really wanting to be a musician. It wasn't so much sitting in the audience in adoration. I got to see the groupies. I got to see what went on in meetings or, you know, talking to some of these people in hotels like the Albert Hotel, Chelsea Hotel, you know, places where groups would hang out. And being around that was a real privilege. And, and Velvet did know Jimmy. I met Jimmy a couple of times after that. Didn't say much. Just yeah. nodded my head, you know, and, and uh, Velvet started the group with myself and another drummer. And uh, Jimmy did give him a, a, one of his Strat guitars. He had a bunch of them. Yes. And we st- started rehearsing, played a couple of gigs, believe it or not. And uh, um, now that summer, by the way, I, I did go to Woodstock. And we can maybe digress if you want to another point. Yes, my God, the- I've never met. I mean, I, most people have done something, you know, they've seen... This, they've been there, but I've never met anybody who went to Woodstock. Oh, actually, that's a lie. I did an interview with Melanie, and I'm also a member right. of the Incredible String Band. So, okay. Now, um, let me let me ask, may I ask you something? Because I know you're going to edit. Should I save that for separate? Because it's a it's a long story of how I got there, pretending to work there, and a whole another story. But you tell yes, me what you're like. Let's do let's do let's do Woodstock. But does that chronologically run into that? By the way, well, that summer. 69. You know, so, so I was with Velvet, right. And we were playing. Jimmy was playing. And we knew Jimmy was playing Woodstock. Yes. I, used to go, I used to go to the Catskills. It was a place to go when you wanted to get out of New York. So I knew about the festival. Velvet, we were, in the beginning of the summer, believe it or not, Jimmy was staying in a house, up, something called Rygate, New York, which is near Woodstock that he rented. Velvet and I hitched up with a couple of girls from Brooklyn, drove us up there. Jimmy wasn't there, but Edgar Winter was there. Jimmy, Johnny's wife was there. I mean, uh, uh, Johnny Winter's wife was there. Jimmy never showed up. Right. But I did get to meet Edgar when he was unknown at the time. And Velvet and I, we thought we'd stay, but we could. And we came back to New York. I went up to uh, uh, Woodstock. In other words, went up to the festival by myself. So I, I went to someplace called Mountaindale, mm-hmm. where I've been before, 
And I figured I'd go up there. I met this lead singer who I knew from Brooklyn and we figure out what we were gonna do. So we met a couple of girls, spent the night before, like two days before Woodstock, trying to figure out what, it was enjoyable by the way, <laughs> as you can imagine. Yes. And uh, as I was leaving, this girl's house, I noticed she had a guitar case, like a cheap acoustic case. And I'm going, do you play a guitar? She goes, no. I go, what are you going to do with it? She goes, I don't know. Why don't you, why don't you take it? You know, and I go, okay. I, nice. I just, somebody give me acoustic guitar. I had no guitar, of course. And I was taking it with me. So me and my friend walked down to the road. We looked, we figured, we, we looked at the uh, telephone poles where they advertised he was playing. And I go down the thing and I go, you ever hear of this band? Yeah, do you ever hear of this band? Do you ever hear of Santana? And my friend goes, no. I go, either have I. I said, listen, why don't, we're going to hitchhike anyway. Mm -hmm. Why don't we say well, I play in Santana? I've got my guitar case. And this way, maybe somebody will take us. So we started hitchhiking. And I said, hey, can you please do me a favor, man? We got to get to Woodstock area because I'm playing. I'm in Santana. So the guy says, OK. Okay, now I, I throw this in as a caveat. I wondered if this guy 50 years later is going, I drove the guitar player from Santana to Woodstock. Yes, well, I expect he dined out on that one. <laughs> I would have done. Yes. He probably got some sex. So we got to ride back to the area. So we walked to the web, to the site. My idea was, I was, I was kids from Brooklyn, you know, they had to use their brains to get around or anywhere in New York, you know. Yeah. So I figured if we went to the, the Woodstock site, we had no money for tickets. So I figured if we, you know, worked there, like signed up to work, mm -hmm. that at least we can get in there and we wouldn't have to worry about tickets. I didn't know the next day they kicked down the gates and that we didn't need tickets. I signed up with my friend. We did you know, signed up for construction, you know, just lifting, you know, hit, hammering nails. So I was listed there. So when I went back the next day, of course, you can get in. But mm. because I had signed up to work and now I lost my friend. I don't know what happened. Met some girl, never saw him again. All right. I met some girl, but I knew where I was. Anyway, <laughs> things were great back then. You didn't worry about any, any of the things we were about today, you know. Yes. But because... I had a, 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 a placard saying I worked there. I ended up meeting somebody from security and asked if I can work in security. As a result, I had a place to sleep and eat because it was trailer. You know, mm -hmm. they had trailers. Now, if I didn't, I would be, in, I'd probably have met somebody and ate their food and slept with them, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Because everybody was friendly, but because of that particular thing I did, I was able to get a security pass. And the next day that became a security pass to go down the hill. And the third day I was able to go like maybe five, 600 feet from the stage because Fantastic. of the pass. All right. You follow me? Yeah. So anyway, it was muddy as hell. And the first day, and of course seeing, you know, Richie Haven, who I used to see play the streets of the village with Velvet. We, we knew him. And also all the, uh, Crosby Stills and Nash, of course, second day was amazing. You know, I love mountain Crosby. I mean, uh, Credence Clearwater, the groups were amazing. And now they're all legends, of course, yeah. which That's is wonderful because they, they deserve it. Canned Heat were a great blues band. Uh, boy, they were just everybody. And Mountain and you, I had seen as different. And did you Got, get to see The Who and Santana? Well, Sly played before The Who. Yes. And Sly was my favorite band. I, when I saw Jimmy at uh, Fillmore, Sly opened for Jimmy. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I'm saying Bill Graham was a genius. I love Sly. I mean, I love playing funk, Motown. It's, it's in my blood, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and Sly was just amazing. The music, the, the, the dancing, I love him. So then Jimmy played. So Sly was amazing. It was, it was the most, you know, when you saw, you saw the video, you saw what was going on. Everybody in the hill chanting. Yes. And remarkable. And then I saw um, The Who afterwards. And The Who are my favorite band. One of my favorite bands. Uh, not only because they were characters, and Keith Moon, I mean, you never knew what was going to happen. Townsend, I loved his writing, his, his guitar, and John M. Wilson was, you know, and Daltrey was a great front man. Yeah, he, he was. He really was at the time. Fabulous. And I love John M. Wilson, of course, one of and, and my day. And did you see the Abby Hoffman moment where... Yeah, of course I did. It was <laughs> wonderful. Townsend did that at Fillmore East in New York when there was, supposedly there was a fire there and a fire marshal got on stage to warn everybody to leave and Townsend kicked him off the stage. Right. And his rationale was when he was playing, 
that was sacred ground and mm-hmm. nobody comes on that stage. If, if maybe somebody would have told the manager, hey, we got to get on, it would have happened. So Abby Hoffman, he started to get up there and talk some crap and Townsend just kicked him <laughs> off the stage. <laughs> I loved it. Yes. It was and and then um, I wish I had been closer to get that guitar read through, of course. Yeah, that was but, really nice. You know, it became but anyway, so that was so anyway, Jimmy was a no show. I thought he was not gonna play because it got so late, they were so far behind. So I went to sleep after I, I didn't stick around, I didn't see I'm not sure when Janice played and Je- Jefferson Airplane played the next morning. But uh when I was sleeping, I, I woke up and I said, What's going on? I hear I hear it was it was over basically. And I saw Jimmy starting his set. So I ran down the hill. If you look at the uh, video, there's hardly anybody there picking up yes. garbage. And that's when Jimmy did his set, which I knew he was going to do because I some of those people he had, I knew from New York, the Congo players, you know, and everything. And when he did the Star Spangled Banner, I started laughing at first. But Jimmy, Jimmy, when he was playing his shows, when he improvised, he always threw in like commercials, like lines from different things you'd never suspect. So at first I just thought he was like just riffing, but when he did it, God, did I know the, signif- the significance of that all these years later, right. that this became, this became something that was beyond you know, Woodstock. I, I, and I will say, uh, before I end my Woodstock story, uh, to me, the, that generation that I grew up in, you know, anti-war, you know, the Vietnam War, I knew people were getting drafted. I was lucky I had a high draft number. But that was a significant time where youth was taken over from the establishment. And to me, Woodstock wasn't just a bunch of people. It was a victory for the youth revolution. All of a sudden, we were credible. Music was credible before all the men, all the big companies got involved and knew they could make money off of that. Yes. It was really, it, it, was, it wasn't hippies. It wasn't free love. It was like the, the uh, culmination of what we started two years earlier, I think. Yes. And it was it was remarkable. It was pretty amazing. But then, you know, you were back in the West Coast. How did you get home on that Monday, by the way? Or did you? Well, I'll tell you that in a minute. So so <laughs> after after Jimmy, what do you do in New York? I, I had I didn't have a, nothing but my bag and my clothing. And so I guitar. started hitchhiking. Started hitch- <laughs> no, the guitar case I lost. But I got a, one more thing. The night I got to Woodstock, I had nowhere to sleep, right, before the next day. So mm. there was like one of these board, boarding houses that converted to a hotel. When I was on the couch sitting, pondering what the hell I was going to do, there was a guitar case next to me, opened the guitar, was a guild acoustic in there, right, beat up. I started playing it. Then there was a fire, alleged. It was basically smoke. So everybody ran out that was in there, ran back in, slept on the couch. Nobody claimed the guitar. I told the, the manager, I go, look, I don't know if somebody left it. Here's my phone number. I took the Guild acoustic with me. I still have it to this day, by the way. Blimey. That's that's incredible. That's only 53 years later. It's a 64 Guild acoustic. But imagine that. I, I didn't think. I found a guitar. Nobody called me. And that was just luck that I happened to be in that rooming house, literally. Yes. And that guitar is still with me. So, okay, the next day, of course, getting back. Uh, of course, I'm hitchhiking a, a, a Volkswagen camper van associated with hippies drove by, of course. Such and, a they, they go, and I go, can I get a ride? And they go, where are you going? I said, Brooklyn. They're going, we're going to Queens. We'll drop you off at the train station. Got on. They were smoking hash, smoked some hash, fell asleep, woke up, took the train to Brooklyn. And I walk. My mom goes, where you been? I go, you're not going to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> She probably said, don't tell me too many details. So anyway, the, 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 the end of my Woodstock story is four weeks later, I got a check for $40. Blimey. That's, Believe that's, it or not. That's, I, that, that is unbelievable because, frankly, they didn't make a lot of money, did they, until they sold and I, No, no, but because I signed up to work construction, yeah. that's why I got paid. So what did I do with the check? I said, Mom, I know I stole money to get my base a few months ago. I'm paying you back now. <laughs> she goes, I know. Thank you. <laughs> Is it checking the balance? I go, I hope not. God. So anyway, that, that was the Woodstock thing. But a year later, now you understand, I'm in the audience of Woodstock. I was just a kid, right? Yes. A year later, Jimi Hendrix had died. In, in this, I had gone to California in the start of 1970, like in June, okay, after I graduated. Yeah. Jimmy died in September. So while I was away, 
Velvet called me and said there were people interested in, in signing him because he knew Jimmy. I flew back to New York. We did a demo at Record Plant. And that demo got us a record deal with Michael Lang's company called Sunshine Records. Now, if you can figure out a year earlier, I was in the audience. Now I'm signing a record deal with Velvet in Woodstock. Pretty crazy, huh? That is a cosmic thing, especially with Michael, who frankly is... Um... He's got quite an interest in record, hasn't he, of, of kind of success and sight failures. He, he did a lot. He, well, who doesn't in big business? But he started, again, he was the perfect guy to take everybody to the next level. Yes. There you and, go. But he, then he organized Altamont as well, which perhaps, you know, was Well, nice. that was just, that was a cluster F. You know why. But you know why? Because the lawyers and they keep changing venues and everybody knew that was not a good place to do it. And the Hells Angels work in security was definitely uh, a blunt, a blunder. Yeah. The HR, the, the, the HR department should have done better. So, so anyway, real quick. So because of Jimmy, because of him dying, we got a record deal with sunshine records. Tom Wilson was our producer who produced uh, Elvin underground, Bob Dylan, Simon and Garfunkel. So he wanted to go to California to record the album is how I got back to California. Yes. And that got that started us doing the album and living in California for a bit. And just just on that bit about you know guitar plays and obviously the influence of Jimi Hendrix as well as people like Jeff Beck. But with Jimi Hendrix, I mean, there was also another young guitarist that got influenced by Hendrix, which was Randy California, who went on to be part of Spirit, who were one of my favorite bands in the early seventies. Though I only listened to them in the eighties, but um, yes, did you ever come across Randy California and 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 that bunch? Because funny you asked. Funny you asked. I played with him at the Whiskey with Bruce Gary, our Knack drummer. Right before the Knack, uh, Bruce was good friends with Randy. I'm good friends with Fuzzy Knight, who played bass for Spirit, by the way. Fuzzy, get out, Fuzzy. And he's a great guy. I love him. If you ever want to talk to him, I'm really good friends with him. Fuzzy. And uh, he played with Spirit. And I played with Randy at the Whiskey before I went to England. When I came back, we were going through issues with the Knack later, later and with Bruce. And we actually made some demos with Randy. We co-wrote a song with Randy and uh, nothing ever happened with it. But of course, sadly, you know, Randy ended up um, drowning, you know? Yeah. He, so he had some issues. He, yeah. And, um, but he was brilliant, brilliant guitar player. And Was Spirit he, were a great band. How did his guitar playing compare to some of Hendrix or Velvet? Um, well, Velvet was a great rhythm player. His leads were passable, but see, Jimmy, I mean, if Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton, when they saw Jimmy, said, we're done. <laughs> you know, And yes. they had to go home and go, what are we going to do now? In other words, in his, they were, Jeff Beck is one of my favorite guitar players and who keeps reinventing himself who is incredible and still plays like nobody else. You know, I, I got to tell you, who knew, yes. right? And, and he survived, but uh, Jimmy played different, but the same. He just made everything his own somehow. Yes. He was a great blues player, just great, just uh, re remarkable how he controlled sound and everything. So you really can't compare him to anybody else. Velvet could play some lead, but even somebody remotely thinking he was somehow going to be artistically as good as Jimmy. It was a farce. Yes. And, no, and Velvet felt the pressure. I mean, if you listen to that album, you'll see he, sung, he sings very similar to Jimmy, the inflection and the voice quality. But And the guitar playing is good, but, you, you know, if Jimmy never existed, you wouldn't have judged Velvet so harshly. No. And, um, and what about Randy? What was his... How did you Randy, was, Randy was, an, was a really good guitar player, and he, he was... He didn't borrow from Jimmy. He may be influenced, but Randy took from other guitar players to make his style. In other words, whatever was going on. So he, he played like Jimmy when he wanted to. He did a really good Jimmy. Yes. But I, I don't think he stole his style to make him more popular. Yeah. If that makes any sense. And to be honest, his best song was the, um, probably well, most well-known was the acoustic song, Nature's Way, wasn't it really? Yeah, but he was brilliant. Another guy who, Unfortunately, he had some mental issues. It always bugged him. He was very strange, as, as, as Fuzzy tells me. But he was a nice guy. And unfortunately, you know, mental illness did get the best of him in the end, probably. Yeah. And maybe I... that, you know, that's life, you know. 
he did hope. I thought he drowned by trying to save his son in the in a river, or was that just possibly? Um... I don't think he was particularly a good swimmer, and but whatever it was, I think he just his lungs or his ill health probably. It was heroic what he did, of course. Yeah. But maybe his ill health was a factor. His style didn't really... It was okay in the early 70s, but he did seem a bit dated in the 80s in the, the whole kind of psychedelic yeah. kind of sound. It did, it did sort of just seem a bit... Well, a lot of music, music industry changes. Other, and then, by the way, the demos I have, some of the songs I'm re- recording with Bruce and Randy were more pop-oriented. Yes, they weren't just jams and solos. So it's pretty. He was pretty versatile. I give him a lot, and I mean, you know, we all miss him, and Fuzzy misses him a lot still. Well, yeah, absolutely. And his stepfather was the drummer, wasn't he? Ed, was it? Yes, Ed. Ed. Yeah, Fantastic. he was a character. He Amazing. was bald before people thought bald was cool. <laughs> <laughs> but then, look, sixty nine, seventy. You go to California after Woodstock. Then there was obviously there was the you know we'd had the summer of love. There was like Jimi Hendrix had died, Jim Morrison, then Janis Joplin, all in the same period. And then there was the, the whole Charles Manson thing because I know I've done a few interviews with people who said in that area during that time there was a bit of an odd dark vibe around that you just felt something bad was happening. Did you sort of pick that up as a sort of a young sort of late teen kind of? Well, well, luckily I think being in New York during that time period, some of that kookiness died away. I think people got a little smarter because there were a lot of, I think, whether it's drugs or whatever it was, there was a lot of crazy going around. Yes. I mean, I used to hitchhike. I, I mean, like anybody, everybody hitchhiked. I, I don't think it was, when I got there with Velvet in uh, um, 71, we came to record our album. It, it wasn't, it was still pretty cool. It wasn't any of that helter skelter stuff, <laughs> and a lot of the stuff in the streets, you know, the helter skelter stuff. I read a book recently. A lot of people think that Manson, the fact that he didn't get arrested right away and lived a long life, that he did do some informant stuff for maybe the CIA or FBI, right? Possibly because he got away with a lot. And uh, however that shakes out, I don't know. But I think more in the in the acting, I think the actors and actresses in that industry, I think they were getting more bodyguards, more so, because they were more visible. Yes. And obviously, Absolutely. you know, Polanski and Sharon Tate, of course, terrible, you know, that was, mm-hmm. so I think it was more affected that than the music. I didn't, the music scene was incredible in LA in 71. Yeah. 72 so i didn't feel the uh aftermath of that at all i suppose it just felt like with the 60s and i've done a few interviews with people from that period from london and and you know they pretty well disappeared in the 70s a guy called barry miles who was kind of quite a movie yep. maker and various other people and i asked him you know at one of these events it was an exhibition at the vna so you want a revolution i said he said what happened to you in the 70s and he said actually we were just all really tired and we just all needed a break and 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 kind of after having a few years off probably the scene changes so quickly from the glam period to then punk you know that, oh yeah you know, and by things... the way did you, see, did, did you see the documentary for the band oh yes it's brilliant and you could see that how everything changed for them how the market changed around them and how they had to break up and it's crazy, huh? And getting into a lot of the heroin and drinking and, you yeah. know, they had a different life. They were brilliant. And they changed, Eric Clapton quit the cream because he wanted to be in a band like the band. This is and true. that's when he started playing with, by the way, I did see him with Delaney and Bonnie at Fillmore. And oh. Clapton played with them. And Harrison played some shows in Europe with them too. Amazing. So I'm just saying, that, so the band has an interesting story. Having gone to Woodstock, did the whole thing, you know, lived there in the commune and Bearsville Records was started, you know, Todd Rudgren, of course, was producing and signed with them. So it was an interesting time. And I guess that dream when big business got involved started to change a bit. Dylan lived up there, of course. Yeah. So it was it was very interesting. 
It's amazing. So, yeah, but then I suppose, you know, having three people die so quickly, which is a real shock, and also the Beatles breaking up, I just wondered, you know, whether people went, yeah. oh, God, perhaps that is the end, you know, because there, there was a documentary or film, Shine a Light with, you know, the Rolling Stones, and there was an interview with Mick Jagger from about 64, where he's asked, you know, how long it will go on for, and he, he ponders this and looks into the... Yeah, I know that. Looks up and goes, oh, another 18 months. And we all chuckle, because obviously that was, you know... 50 plus well, years I, before doing well I, I was I saw the Rolling Stones get to Yaya's when they did Madison Square Garden and Terry Reed opened that show I love Terry Reed by the way nobody remembers him very much I know um, and that's and he's got some dates this summer and it, there was an album he did The River as well as um the track brilliant record. I Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was I was saying there's a there's a couple of albums of his. I think one's River with a track called Dean on, but um and there's another one which I'm gonna have to Google later. But yes, Terry Reed was just extraordinary. He's just got I, such. I, a great I, voice. I was a big Terry Reed fan. I did see him when he opened for in, in Madison Square Garden. BB King alternate and Tina Turner also was on. Now it's uh, by the way, I love that band. Let me tell you. Yeah. What what a what a super group. And I saw the Stones. To me, it. That was a pinnacle. I mean, I mean, they got better. I mean, the Stones are the Stones, but that particular show was a comeback show for them. The first tour they did in America, and of course, Altamont was later. But the, but that show in the beginning was just, I can't tell you how good it was. Uh, for the band, the tightness, the album, of course, uh, Let It Bleed was, you know, come on. How brilliant is that? Well, I think there was those albums with the guitarist. Was it Mick Taylor? They were all fantastic, you know, tracks. And then when Mick Taylor leaves and Ronnie takes over, the the kind of quality of the the albums aren't quite so good because Exile on Main Street is just extraordinary as well, isn't it? Let it bleed, Exile on Main Street, and another couple. But then... well, and Let It Bleed, by the way, Mick only plays in a couple of things because they were started recording that when Brian was still alive. Right. So, and Hockey Talk Woman was separate. And of course, Mick played on that, Taylor. And they uh, also, a lot of their style came from Ry Pooter, who was hanging out with the open tunings and stuff. Yes. Uh, it was very much influenced Keith. And by the way, that was a great song to come back with, wasn't it? What Amazing. a perfect Stone song. And um, I, we don't have to talk now about it, but I, I got to befriend Mick Taylor's wife when I lived in England. And as a result, I got to meet Mick and go to concerts by the Stones, and also met Mick and Bianca a couple of times. Nice. That's my Chelsea apartment. Because I think he lived in Suffolk for a while, Mr. Taylor. He did. He had a house there, and then he also lives, I think, in Knightsbridge, maybe. Yes. I, I, have my, I have my phone book that I lived when I was in London, so <laughs> I know I didn't make this up. Okay, <laughs> I know. I'm, I, I completely agree. Yes, absolutely. So look, then 71, then, New Decade. You're probably 16, yeah. by then. No, you're probably a bit later than that. No, no, 18, yeah. 18. <laughs> a, re- a veteran at this hey, stage. I could be anything you want. I could, yes. Well, let's, yeah, let's, let's have a slightly, yeah, let's keep the narrative vaguely cool. But look, then what happens in 71? Because obviously glam is appearing in this world and, and the other, you know, the main players are sort of all slightly having a time off and, and oh, frankly never, sport. well, they do make a bit of a comeback, but, you know, there's a new, new kids on the black, well, that's a terrible thought, isn't it? But um, yes, and the new wave of 16, uh, yeah. 18 year olds want their, their soundtrack, aren't they? And obviously they- Well, uh, that's what, when, so when I get to London in April of 73, I'm living there, right? Uh, everything you talked about, Slate, Susie Quattro, all these, uh, David Essex, all these groups are coming out, of course, and, and uh, you know, Bowie had his Mata Hoople, of course, after that. But it, it's remarkable because the diversity of, of the pop world, uh, the Roxy music as well, yes. were, were, were happening. And I thought they were pretty cool in their own right. And of course, Brian Eno, what a genius he, he uh, became. But I loved the scene and watching, uh, you know, Top of the Pops and being in London. I was a big T-Rex fan, of course. Yes, he was the man, wasn't he, at the time? He was great. And my hair was long and curly, so people, I've got some people who thought I was Mark Boland, but I said, well, he'd have to wear like eight, nine inch heels to, to be my height. However, <laughs> thank you for the compliment. Yes. But um, he, I saw him in LA at the Whiskey Go Go and uh, at uh, Civic Center, Civic, Santa Monica Civic, where of course Bowie's concert was. And believe it or not, the Doobie Brothers opened for T Rex. How bizarre that is. 
Yes, that there was, was a bunch of hippies. A bunch of hippies when T Rex came on. Go, what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because his his stuff in the seven in the sixties that John Peel used to play on his show called The Perfume Garden. Yeah, he did a lot of kind of um, amusing poetry, didn't he? Quite in you know. He was of... he was amazing. A poet. His lyrics are are his lyrics. Nobody else could have written his songs. Donovan was an influence. I heard that right away. His vocal, the way he quivers, his vibrato sometimes. Yes. And his imagery is very poetic. But everything else, he created a whole a whole movement. People, my, my kids love him. You know, well, growing up, listening to it. I mean, and sadly, excess. And, you know, I mean, can you imagine him and Bowie were very competitive. There was a story, of course. And they had the same producer at the because time. Tony Visconti. He was brilliant, brilliant guy. But anyway, they used to fight about who's going to be more famous, you know. And yes. T Rex was biggest thing, you know. Unfortunately, you know, his health and drugs and and people. Celebrity does take a toll on people. And Bowie was the dark horse, literally. And Bowie, Bowie became the, as you know, more than just anything ever could have imagined. Yeah, visionary, brilliant. You everything would, you know you wouldn't have thought it from his work in the 60s that he was going to be able to become such a sort of incredibly interesting artist who took so many chances for basically every album he did because he did 10 albums in the 70s as well as produce you know iggy pop lou reed and absolutely re- Martha and, Hoople, of course. And, and relocate several times as well as doing world tours and do a couple of films as well that's kind of a lot he packed into the 70s and he then, survived and he slightly about, survived I, I met his wife too. I met Angie, and I also met Mark, uh, Mark Boland's wife. Yeah, the, the, the circle I was when June was married to him. They were both very intelligent, very motivated women who had a lot of, I believe, a lot of credit goes to both of them that helped mold their careers. By the way, yeah, especially Angela Bowie, who dressed Bowie early on. You know. Yeah, well, if it wasn't for, this is my theory anyway, if it wasn't for Angie or Tony DeFries, Bowie, David wouldn't, yep, have, yep. wouldn't have really been the artist because he wasn't going anywhere with his 60s work or his his stuff that he was doing, his folky music that he did with Hermione and John Cambridge. Um, exactly. And it was all pretty, I mean, I, I mean... <laughs> No, I, I absolutely love Bowie and I've made it a bit of a thing to sort of interview as many people who were connected to Bowie as possible. But his 60s work was not, you know, I, well, oh yeah, that's what gets me, is that when all this music was being done by, you know, Hendrix, Jefferson Airplane, The Beatles, The Science, The Kings, et cetera, et cetera, you know, David was coming along, releasing records that you think, oh my God, I can't believe anyone would say it was worth it because it was like who would buy that if you could have bought are you experienced or oh sergeant pepper or david bowie's album you know it wasn't that special so i kind of think that angie must have somehow did something quite extraordinary it, to them. it um, was it was a confluence of things however don't forget space oddity was so genius and nobody knew about it nothing happened to it right yes. and only after ziggy and later did that song even come out and of course became a hit. I mean, look what a visionary he was. I mean, that album with Width of a Circle on it and uh, their version of a Nirvana song. I mean, yes, he was is... so ahead of everybody. Yeah. And I think it took a while to catch up and, and the fact that he killed off Ziggy so soon after that big success took a lot of courage. Yeah, to basically amazing. gone, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to walk my walk. And he had enough talent to back it up. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Remarkable. It was. It was quite a brave because just because Mark Boland is just kind of just trying to be. But look at Mark Boland. I knew who he was when he used to sit and play. Nobody gave a damn about him. In America, he was nothing. So you could say that about him. He didn't do anything. He was a pop star, but until he became electric, nobody really cared very much for him. No, my God. Right. I I mean. no, he didn't. He he was a cult artist in England, but I don't think yep. he wasn't anything else. But then, as as seventy as the seventies, well, yeah. So look, after Velvet, what we what was the band you were in next? By the way, well, at, when Velvet was, we were breaking up only because a the money ran out. Of course, uh, Family Productions took over. Uh, Sunshine Records was basically not doing well, so Artie Rip owned Kamasutra Records. He came in and took over 
our album as well as some other artists. Billy Joel was uh, also uh, was writing songs in the back areas, you know, where uh, their office was, Family Productions, by the way. So they did discover Billy Joel. What a yes. find, huh? Why but um, <laughs> but so basically, Family Productions brought our contract. We re-recorded a couple of songs. It was released. Nothing, you know, happened because. There was no promotion. So I got a chance. I, I did a TV show with Arthur Lee. He was doing a solo, Arthur Lee from Love. Yes. And he was doing a solo career. He had an album out called Vindicator. Just came out. And I rehearsed with him. He was pretty well out of his mind at the time. But I thought maybe I'd play with him. Did a TV show. Nothing happened after. Then I got a chance to go to Boston. A, a, a keyboard player who I knew wanted to fly me over and i think growing up i somebody told me as long as you get a round trip ticket you can go anywhere right, right? and that was a big thing for me i'm sorry so yes. um so i got a chance to go to boston with with a cover a cover original band and that's when Aerosmith smith was starting the modern lovers were starting it was a great great musical period in in boston by the way and I stayed there for six months. I still went to New York in the weekends when I wasn't playing to go to Max's Kansas City. And I, I was friends with uh, Arthur Barrow from the Dolls, too, by the way. Right. Nice. And they were a trip. And by the way, I was at their con. I know it's like, who, who's this guy? I was at there when I was living in London. That's when they first performed at Bebas. Right. Remember that? Yes. I mean, maybe you did. I well, was I there at that show. Did, yeah. So. So that's when Johnny was in the band, wasn't he? And yeah, um, people went nuts. By the way, that they loved the Dolls in London. Yes, and but was that the tour they were doing with the Sex Pistols and the Clash, or were that going to be? A I, bit... That was that was later. I think this was their first album. They went to nobody really knew them. Said they were getting a lot of exposure yes. at the time, and they were pretty wild. And they were Max's Kansas City developed. Aerosmith used to play there as well and got credibility. Yes. So what did, well, how did it compare with CBGBs? Because you, you had sort of Max's and then you had CBGBs. CBGBs, I was gone when they started. We mm -hmm. played there later on than that. But basically I was gone by then because I was living in London. You know, I went to Boston, then I lived in London for two years. And then I didn't go back to New York uh, for a while because I was in L.A. Right. And that's where the knack formed, you know. So I missed a lot of that scene. Yes. So did you get that sense that punk rock was kind of bubbling under the surface with people like Dr. Feelgood? Yeah, I knew there was a there was a whole different feeling. I mean, I left in 75. So I'm not sure. I, I mean, of course, I got into reggae music. I mean, right. I used to go to the speakeasy a lot, you know. Right. And, and other places. But a lot of the music there, I, the punk thing, I think, was starting to develop. I'm not yes. exactly sure of the official date, but, uh, you know, there was a definitely a movement away from the pop glam stuff. So and it was a great you, period for a short term. And did you get to see Bob Marley? Yeah, I did. Amazing. I'm not sure if I saw him speakeasy or one of, one of the places, you know, Ronnie Scott's, I don't know. You know who knows? Yes. Uh, what was it? Monkberry's was another club, which is a pretty cool club. I used to go dancing at Tramps, by the way. Right. <laughs> and private. And I'll tell you the story of George Harrison later. Yes. How I met him, but I, you know, I don't want to, you know, I know, I don't, you know, I know I got to talk about the knack, but the you knack. can yes. do a two parter, but whatever you want to do, we could do a history like we're doing now. Because yes. I think it would be very interesting for people and however we want to, it's your editing. So whatever you want to do. <laughs> so, yeah. So then 77, you know, Royal Silver Jubilee, but actually you're in America back then, aren't you? So how does the, so were you between gigs when the knack started, by the way? Well, when the, when the group fell apart in London, I could have stayed. I had, I had met somebody who I was seeing, Pat Booth. I don't know if the name's familiar. She ended up becoming a novelist. At the time, she was a photographer. Right. Pat Booth. Pat Booth. You can look her up. You might know her. She started to write novels, but she did photography then. She was knew a lot of people in London. Yeah. And um, I, I could have stayed, but um, my Bruce Gary connection. Bruce was Bruce. Was, uh, did I? Did we talk about Bruce yet? No, not really. Well, really quickly, when I was playing with that English guy, Jeffrey, I mean, that group, 
that went to in California guy, right? We came back to California in the summer to audition drummers because the Scottish drummer we had, we found out had a heroin problem. Yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a shock, huh? <laughs> he was a great, he was a great drummer. And by the way, Jimmy Bain, of course, you know, Jimmy, right? Of him and stuff, play with Ozzy and yeah. a lot of other people. He was, he was friends with Willie back in the day. And, but uh, we came to L.A. because uh, uh, we wanted to go to L.A. because we had money to come back and we wanted to visit again. And we, we auditioned drummers and Bruce Carey was we auditioned. And he was supposed to come back to England to play with us. But before that happened, we went back to England. Uh, he went to play with Jack Bruce. Right. Which is a real honor. OK, so Bruce came to England, but didn't play with us. We jammed with him, but he went play with jack bruce so in the course of that that thing with jack bruce stopped for a while bruce came back to la so when my thing broke up i was in touch with bruce talking to him and believe it or not i don't know how this happened i owe him a lot but he got me i told him i don't have enough money to fly back to la there was an opening in a band for bass players and he said he can get me a ticket to come back to la mm -hmm. and there was a band opening for john mayall that was supposed to go on tour with him so they were able to get money to fly me back. Tell me that's not terrible. <laughs> I yeah. didn't want to bother my parents anymore. I came back to L.A. We played the whiskey with this group. We did a couple other shows. Then Bruce got called back to England to play with Mick Taylor's new group with Carla Olson and Jack Bruce. Nice. How, how weird is that? Awesome. There's a lot of stuff with him on, uh, on television. I'm sure they played for... Uh, that show you know the yes. great show so uh so bruce i go darn it you know what is this thing so anyway i started going to city college i was playing with groups i was studying classical music because I, I started playing piano and uh, met a gentleman who was a big influence in my life he was retired italian stately it was a brilliant pian pianist when he was young i started studying piano started going to city college still playing music and bruce called me in 78 said he was playing with Burton and Doug. These guys are really cool and they need a bass player kind of looks like McCartney and can play like Ann Whistle. So I said, that's me. <laughs> nice. And, nice. And uh, so I auditioned with Bruce and it was magic. We, we, we rehearsed. Uh, we did a showcase actually at the Casablanca records. We were turned down, but that's okay. Who wants to be with Casablanca anyway? And uh, <laughs> We shook hands and we said, okay, we were bands and we played the whiskey uh, June 1st. So that was a magic moment to play with Bruce. And Burton is a brilliant guitar player, unsung to this day. We'll get into Burton. And, and Doug was a great front man, fab fabulous. So this group was the best thing I was ever in. I knew it right off the bat. I didn't know we'd be a hit. I didn't know anything. I just knew this is a band I wanted to be in. Yes, and this was the beginning of your great journey, wasn't it? And did it? Um, and did you feel like you were a, a gang? Did it feel like you were sort of on a mission? Well, at that time, nobody gave a damn. We played the whiskey, then we played every club, two sets a night, Troubadour, Star, Starwood. We did everything. We went up to Frisco to open for bands up there, Great Kin. You know, different. We did anything. We were working bands, but because of the musicianship and Doug's really good front man stuff, we started to become a thing. Mm. And uh, pretty soon we were selling out every club. No record company even sniffed us at that point, by the way. Yes. The only person yeah. that came down to see us was Bruce Raven from Capitol. But there was no, there was no sneaking around forming the knack in secret. That was a real capital way to make the Beatles. See? Yes. Which was a myth that came over later. <laughs> and yes. yeah, seriously, it's, I've given interviews and they go, well, we heard that Capital wanted the new. I said, no, no. So we did all these shows. And because of how good we were and Bruce knew people from Bruce Gary, uh, Eddie Money Jam with us. We did Two Tickets to Paradise. Tom Petty came in. We did Mona and Not Fade Away. Bruce Springsteen is a recording of us uh, uh, playing with Bruce doing Mona and Not Fade Away at the at Troubadour. Ray Manzarek jammed with us. We did some Doors songs. Steve Stills, who wanted to produce us, also jammed with us. The reason I'm saying this is because we were respected as a great musical group, 
not because of anything else. There was no Sharona, there was nothing. And that's what got record companies really jazzed as well as audiences, because you never knew what was going to happen. So that was the early knack. And that's when all of a sudden record companies came down. You know, six mate companies wanted to sign this polygram offer us a million dollars to sign. We were smart enough to know that if you take a million, you're going to owe a million. Um, There was no guarantee we'd have a success, right? Mm -hmm. And we really felt that capital was committed to us. They, the the mail room, the people came to see us, the secretaries came to see us, the A&R people. So it was really a, a wonderful feeling that they all got the knack, literally got where we were doing. Uh, so we did an in- interview and they asked who we wanted to produce and we really mentioned a couple of names. So the story goes, Mike Chapman read that and was pissed off. He goes, why didn't you mention me? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know exactly who Mike was. And, but anyway, so Mike gunned us with capital and we said, Mike, of course, Mike Chapman, man. He came to see us. He goes, okay, guys, I want to do a live. I just want to record you exactly the way you are. And I want to do, and you got a hit song. Now, by the way, Sharona didn't come right away. A lot of the songs in the first album, Sharona, Selfish, um, you know, uh, Lucinda, Let Me Out came from the band playing so many shows that the writing was really good. That came as, we, we had a band sound, and I think it featured that in each of the things. So yes. Mike came to see us and goes, okay, I, I'd love to produce you. He, he signed Blondie at the time, so we said, fuck yeah, that'd be great. So uh, Capital was on board. And um, so we did it. We signed with Capital and we got our dates to start recording. And Mike's whole philosophy was, you know, I want to catch what you do live. You know, I want to I want that to be on the record. Mike is a great producer. And uh, even Blondie, he did a lot of production. It was a different kind of band. Yeah. But, um, you know, different. But. Still, Mike, Mike did some singing on it, by the way, and also did some arrangement credits. With the Knack, we just went in there, basically, and cut all the... David Tickle, who uh, uh, did his own... He's a great producer now. He was an engineer. And he talks about us going in the studio. We basically did all the, all the, all the tracks, cut kind of in four days. Mixed and then mastered. The, the album was done in three weeks. Amazing. That is so and good. Blondie and Blondie, Blondie was working on Heart of Glass when we started the album. And we finished the album, they were finishing the Heart of Glass because it was more of a production number. I mean, I, mean, I only say that in great respect because you know I love I love seeing Deborah Harry walk down the hall. Hey, want a coke? You know, and she's beautiful. <laughs> so but and uh so Mike, so when people call us one hit wonders, I go, no, we were one take wonders. <laughs> Meaning, Sharona was just a run through. You know, we did tracks the first day. So Mike goes, okay, let's run through Sharona, right? So we ran it down, and Mike goes, okay, we got it. We go, what do you mean you got it? He goes, I got it. And he goes, no, 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 no. He says, well, come in here then. Don't, don't question me, right? We go in the studio, and we listen. And, and Mike, Mike, knew, you know, we can do that song ten times in a row and perfectly nail it, right? Yeah. It was something about the first time, the second take, that is so fresh that he wanted to capture that energy. So even though we thought we were just doing a run through, we played with, you know, just abandon. You just, because you're not thinking, you're just playing. And Mike was smart enough to capture that performance. I mean, Doug did a couple of overdubs and vocals, brought him through a couple of licks in maybe, but that was a one take thing, like a lot of the songs. Yeah. And that's what I'm really proud of. And we did that album in three weeks. Amazing. By the way. How did you feel when you watched, if you did watch, the, the Beatles film, which came out on Let It Be, which was the eight hours easy to digest um, movie? Did you, did you sort of watch that and sort of relate to any of it, if you did watch it? Yeah, very much. Because when you're in a group and breaking up a few times like the Knack did, you understand dynamics, literally. Now, of course, nobody could compare with what they went through and survived and had success and families no idea nobody nobody could have done that there was so much talent in the band you know when you look at it in perspective let alone by the way so i've i've got three three children i should say now adults of course Mm -hmm. uh gabriel olivia noah and they've grown up playing shows with me 
I mean, we've done Sharona quite a bit. Me, my son and daughter nailing the lead guitar solo. I never made them musicians. They just heard it and they had a, they had abilities that mm. I would have wished they had. Dave's a great drummer. He actually uh, substitutes on gigs with missing persons sometimes. Fantastic. Who I play with these days. And and you you good kids. So anyway, they have they did their own albums. But watching it with them, especially growing up with the Beatles, and watching the interaction, it, it meant so much. You know, I mean, the the first Let It Be was a butcher job, that thing they did years ago. Yes. And watching this is is fabulous because these guys were were gods. And now you're seeing who they are, which is better because they're real. It, it, what they captured, I mean. And by the way, who knew that I'd follow in their footsteps of getting married and having children? Nobody talks about that. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Everybody talks about oh the success and no, they had they were quite conventional in a lot of things. I know. Well, there's and some lovely touches in the movie. So yeah, it's wonderful. I give I, Peter Jackson. I give him ten awards yes, because absolutely. the way he edited it, how how they showed the different meetings with. Uh, you know, George Martin being, oh, my God, uh, the producer who worked with Glenn, them. Glenn the, Jones. The brilliant producer. They asked the who, asked the Stones, asked, you know, people he worked with. He's brilliant. Yes. So basically, you see his, and I, and I just love seeing them be them. Yoko was not yelled at. She was funny as hell. They all laughed at each other. They all make, you know, John would sing Paul's song. Paul would make fun of John's songs. Ringo was just Ringo. And George <laughs> and George was the uh, dark horse, literally. And who knew he'd have a triple album that was number one. I know. And Amazing. blew away McCartney and Lennon. So that to me is the greatest, like, you want to talk about a guy keeping it together and having a triple number one album? There's George. There is George. There is a, but look, because because I've been doing this this these interviews for a while. I mean, most bands have a sort of five year narrative. You know, they have that first twelve months, which is a bit of a honeymoon period, and then they get the first single, first album, and then there's the sort of the second album, and then the potential third album. You you have quite a similar sort of narrative, don't you? At that time, yeah. You, well, yeah. There's certainly that developed over time. How did you feel? How did you? Because you know, there's there's the turn in the decade. You know, suddenly the eighties appear, and you know, we'd had that sort of the clean cut sort of sound of the punk, and then post punk, and then sort of, you know, like musicals, you know, t- styles change. I just wondered how you felt like going into doing the second album after the the kind of euphoricness of your debut album, which you know must have escalated the band so quickly. Well, again, people forget that we did the work. You know, we we weren't just picked up, put in the studio. There they are, you know. Yes. We we worked up and the narrative of Capitol promoting us. No, nobody knew we were going to have a hit. By the way, Mike Chapman is the only one who said Mike My Sharna was a hit number one song. And when Mike, I wrote it in my journal. When Mike said that to me, I believe Mike. Capitol Records did not release a single. Yes. We were touring Europe and Capitol. Now, God bless their mistake. <laughs> I, and I'll tell you why. You know, normally when you when you promote a new act, sometimes you put out a first single to get people interested. Then you'll put out the, the big single. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's the formula. So with us, they gave by giving the album to radio was ingenious as it turned out because the most requested song in America was My Sharona in two days. As a result of that, they rushed the single out two weeks later. And because of that miscue, the album became number one. So people actually got to hear the album and not focus on the single. So when they call us one hit, sometimes I'm going, well, I mean, Good Girls Don't is a top 10. I'm not going to sit there and go, wow, we had a, a hit and two, you know, it doesn't matter. But, um, but the way it worked out is that people knowing the album was made me happier because I thought it was a great album yes. and the material and the performances were really cool. And so it worked in, in reverse order. So they released the single, the album became number one first and then the single. Mm. So we had been playing nonstop. You know, we did Europe, we did everywhere. We came back. 
um, to LA. We played some gigs in LA. And then we went to Australia and Japan. Love going to Australia. I did some Australian interviews recently. Mm. And again, they're, they're saying the new Beatles. I go, no, 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 no. Please don't do that. <laughs> and we did the Marley show. We did Countdown. It was terrific. Then we did Japan, which was pretty darn good, too. Then we came back to a new, uh, California. And then we did a U.S. tour. And that was wonderful, again, because uh, we were a great live band. We weren't just some guys that had a hit. Yes. And the live shows on YouTube, there's a Carnegie Hall uh, clips of us playing. It's a whole concert, actually. It was supposed to have been released, but they didn't find the proper chain of ownership to get it approved yet. But that concert really sums up that as a four-piece live band, we were pretty good. Yes. And, and, and that pretty well came across. And uh, very simple. We didn't want to do overdo it. I just felt the, the strength of the songs on musicianship and the vocals were really good. You know, we, we managed it. So we came back after a triumphant tour and um, Capital wanted to release more singles. For some reason, we didn't go along with that. Don't know why. I think Frustrated would have been a good single. Mm. In my, my opinion, and everybody has their favorites, maybe. Chapman, uh, to this day, you know, we had a listening party a few years ago. When Mike, it was like a vinyl listening party at somebody's house he was producing at the time and uh, he's a brilliant drummer by the way and he's a dear friend but mike's listening with me and my kids are there and mike's going that should have been a single and that should have been a single and it was you know can you imagine right and mike's <laughs> mike and by the way i played sharona that he came to a club i jammed with sharona with my with my kids playing behind me and some and somebody singing how's that for who knew that's for mike class. chapman right yeah, so that's a nice moment. But Mike's Mike's great. But anyway, so Mike Mike was going through marital issues at the time. You know, being a successful producer, God knows there's temptations. Yes. Uh, and Mike was Mike, and Mike was Mike was flamboyant, brilliant, and no doubt destructive. And by the way, there's a documentary coming out on him. I it was interviewed for two years ago when COVID started. I hope it comes out soon. It, it it gives Mike so much justice. I, oh, I forget fantastic. what it's called. You can look it up. And I was honored to be interviewed and in talking about Mike. Because yes. him and Nicky Chin wrote so many hits. And yeah. he he was amazing. He, he deserves credit. I, lo I love Mike as a person. He's a father. You know, he's been remarried. And he's, ama he's amazing. So he anyway. Was like, he was a bit like, a, I suppose, a Mickey Most of that period, wasn't he? In his own right, yeah. He started the record label too, but it didn't quite work out, unfortunately. Tricky business. Maybe it's a long time. A, a real tricky business. Yes. And, you know, God knows. But Mike, uh, again, and I knew Holly Knight, who Mike started writing. I was going to be in Holly Knight's band. And Holly Knight, with Mike, co-wrote Tina Turner's song. Yes. Uh, could the comeback song, as well as for other groups too, by the way. Love is a Battlefield, I think Holly wrote that song oh with Mike God. for that. Is, that. is that Pat Benatar? Yeah, and Pat Benatar, Mike produced as well. <sighs> what a time. classic. Yes, so when you, when you were sort of, we hit 81, Brown Trip comes out. Oh, we, that... Wait, I got to talk about the second album. We, but we the got to understand, yes. Yeah, but they, but they didn't. They didn't understand, okay? did they? Nobody should have made the little girls even focus. So we didn't have to come out with a single. We we're nominated for two Grammy Awards. Okay? Yes. Now I'm telling you this, you gotta understand this, however you slice and dice this interview. It's not an apology, but it's it's damn well of what happened. Because we were offered every TV show you can imagine. We were offered to be in the Mark Mindy show. We were offered to be in a Donna Summer special. We were offered to be in Friday nights, mm -hmm. which became Saturday Night Live. We were off the Dick Clark show, and oddly enough, Dick Clark wanted to do a short film on us because, in a way, we were a new phenomena. Well, we didn't do any of them because the manager, who was a novice, and Doug felt we had to do the perfect show. Everything was happening so fast. And because we didn't kiss ass and do everybody's favor, and because we were too big, too quick, you've got to pay your dues. And if you got to do all these other things for other people, you better do it. Mm. And we did, and we didn't. And by doing that, we became kind of like outcasts. 
I know it sounds stupid. Basically, to become successful, you got to kiss ass. In our case, when we were successful, we should have gone backwards. If you know what I mean, and not isolated. Yes, absolutely. Didn't make any sense at all? We should have done all the TV shows that everybody, Don Kirshner's Midnight Special, everybody did them. And it breaks my heart when I see reruns and we're not there. So we didn't do American TV. We didn't go to the Grammys. We could have played there. We ended up doing a second album, that was ill-advised. And then we went to Japan again to do a province tour. So Capital, I blame them because if you're going to put out a follow-up single with Sharona, you damn well better make sure that you sample that song to make sure it's even a contender. I mean, you just don't, I know maybe Doug pushed it a bit, but you don't put out a follow-up single where all the A&R people go and listen. Sharona was so big, you cannot put out a song unless it's as good, if not better. Does it make sense? Yes. And um... so Capital puts out the album. I didn't like the cover. The insert was cool. I liked the songs. I thought Mike could have done a better job, but Mike wasn't really around as much as normal. And Mike was distracted. And I think Mike accepted what we did and maybe he could have been more critical of it. But Mike had his own life to deal with. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Uh, Doug blamed Mike in a way. Mike was dressing up like a commander then. He was kind of losing his mind. Yeah. <laughs> There's a picture in a band magazine where he's dressed as a military. They call him the commander, okay? <laughs> or something, which is a joke, you know. But but nobody nobody hit the stop button. Because um, you... that album had quite a bit of criticism about the lyrical content, didn't it? Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> well, let me put it like this. I hate to be real, but we were Doug's lyrics were called misogynist, on the, which is a joke in this world. And if Steven Tyler wrote those lyrics or Robert Plant something, nobody would have blinked. But yes. Doug is not one of those sex, sexual guys, so his words maybe take on a different meaning. And Sharona's lyrics, well, you know, a little, little uh, you know. And uh, Selfish, Selfish is a great lyric, even though it's a little nasty. I think it's a, gr- a great lyric. And that could have been a single. I think Doug felt like, well, we don't want to edit. And Good Girls Done was actually edited in Canada. They cut out a couple of lines, by the way. Mm, yes. So I think Doug liked that kind of nastiness. And Burton, too, wrote some of the lyric. I was actually on the tour bus, and I said, no, don't. I'm sorry to say this, but it's true. I said, no, it's don't do it. They're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're not going to play it. Guess what? England wouldn't play it because of the lyric. How's yes. that for bizarre? And anyway, musically, they compared the song to Sharona. It's in the key of G. That's it. <laughs> the riff is completely different. The, the bridge is more like Zeppelin. If you really listen to the, the B section of the song, you know, it's got this kind of groove to it. It's nothing to do with Sharona. But what I'm saying is when you have a hit like Sharona, you better damn well think what you're going to put out next. Yes. The fact that they put that as a single was Harry Curry or jumping off the Titanic, you know, you think about it. And I, it came out, the album was like top 30. Uh, Baby Talks Dirty was already on the charts and immediately it went, it went south because every, every critic that was waiting to eat us, every smug record exec, and a lot of musicians resented us because record companies told them, well, if they can do an album for 17,000. Why can't you? <laughs> We got a lot of, we got a lot of, un, you know, it wasn't our fault, but yes. so there was such a wave of negativity ready to explode by the critics that the new Beatles, my, the new Beatles, my ass kind of thing. So that releasing that single, not doing the Grammys, I'm not making excuses. I'm just telling you the truth. Yes. I think it wasn't that we were up to the job. It wasn't that we imploded. It wasn't, we weren't good songwriters or great musicians. You, you, nobody took the the impossibility and, and understanding that if you're going to compete with Sharona, then you better damn well have a good song. Yeah. A great, a, and by doing that, we ended up opening a door of negativity. Yeah. And That's that true. put so much pressure on us. Yes, because I uh, guess at the time there'd been people like Elvis Costello, Joe Jackson, as well as Graham Parker before, Nick Lowe and Dave Edmonds. So you were slightly in that world weren't you you'd been yeah and those guys are great 
but they didn't have the success we did. And they were compared to the Beatles. So in other words, we were great musicians. I love Elvis Costello. He was actually on top of the pops when we played there and judged us off. How cool is that? <laughs> That's very cool. That's very cool. And we and we did we did we did Tiz was by the way in England. We were hitting the face with pies. Did you know that? Yes, no, but I remember seeing Motorhead on something like Tiz. That was that was, we we did a British TV, we did Japanese, we did Italian TV, we did Australian TV, we didn't do American TV. You figure that one out. Yeah, that was strange. Tiz was anyway. That's all. But, to, but anyway, so we after all that stuff. The, the, we stayed together because we played the forum in LA, which is for us to be playing the Troubadour a year before. And now we sold out the forum in a couple of hours was the greatest thrill in a lifetime. And that show was incredible. And yeah. by the way, we ended, we ended with, we love you. The stone song. Fantastic. Think about it. We used to do a lot of covers by the way, through the years, like on this new album, they have last train to Coxville, which we, we cover that we cover, the Beatles, we cover, uh, you, I mean, Lawyers, Guns, and Money we did as a cover. You know, we did Cinnamon Girl. We did a, a lot of things we wanted to do. So Last Train of Clarksville, we love the monkeys. We love pop music. And that's why we did it on that album, by the way. Yes, we do love that. So af- after the forum and me meeting Britt Eklund afterwards, did an after party, which was the highlight of that night <laughs> and of my life, because I didn't know her for a little bit. And Noah and her kids went to Disneyland with her kids, believe it or not. So that was a great night for me. But after that, I think Doug uh, got involved with AA, which probably saved his life. Yes. And and did and gave and really helped his situation. But I remember the car ride after that and going, you know, Prescott, um, listen, I need to ask you forgiveness. And I'm going, for what? <laughs> Can I make a list, please? <laughs> it's yes. anything, but it's not a joke. I go, well, I will forgive you, but can I like at least read you the reasons why first? <laughs> My God. Okay. You, yes. Yeah, and Doug was great, but Doug got a bit dictatorial. See, my favorite, my quote is we were successful because of Doug and in spite of Doug. Yes. Because his, 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 anger maybe and a bit of acidic uh you know feelings about the music business i think kind of hit him back unfortunately and as a result there was the band was not feeling good so we broke up at that point yes and uh the reason we got back together if i may jump in Mm -hmm. was when john lennon was dispatched assassinated Whatever you say, it, it still hurts. Mm. I, I can't even imagine that and, and everything. And uh, we were deciding who might produce us if Capitol would do a third album, which they did. And we decided on Jack Douglas. And, you know, Jack being around Lennon, I'm sure was very attractive to Doug and myself too. But he was a brilliant engineer. He had done Aerosmith and a lot of other groups. And he came to L.A. and he really wanted to work with us. And he didn't want to work with anybody else at the time. I think there's one other artist he was starting with. But that was a big compliment to, to us that he would want to work with us. Mm. So we wrote new material and uh, we worked at Record Plant. And man, was Jack great. And if, you, if you're familiar with that album, if you're not, it's your fault. Yes. <laughs> it's, it, to me, it's our best album besides the opening album. Because the, the 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 display of musicianship, the songwriting, the lyrics, Doug's vocals and Burton's vocals, and our playing was phenomenal. We can do any style of music, and the, the, we didn't do that as a show you stuff. The, all, each song dictated our style, but when you hear that with fresh ears, as I do, I, that can come out t- tomorrow and and be revered as a great musical uh, songwriting as well as instrumental journey. And Jack was fa- fantastic. And the thing about Jack that was really cool, he'd play us cassettes of some of the infighting in the control room when he was doing uh, that album with John Yoko. That was something I wish they had, but what? nobody had iPhones. Because that was like, you know, and, and Lita Carla was the engineer, but, you know, it's funny because you really get an inside picture of what went on, right? And Jack, to work with John and make such a great album, and, and that is a great album, by the way. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think because he had been around John, it gave us a sense of, so I can't explain it. 
connection. Yes, in a well, different absolutely. way. Absolutely, it was it was so soon, wasn't it? So then, after that album, yeah, so came, when you were now the album was great. Yes. The album was great. We got good reviews. We toured, which was great. Unfortunately, Capital this time made a major blunder. I'm sorry to blame everybody else, but that's their job. They picked a single to be released, not the one that is obvious to release. They released a ballad, a song called Pay the Devil. Now, Burden wrote that song and Doug, but it was it was a great, if, I don't know if you've heard it. It's a great country ballad. Why the hell is Capital staking their reputation and releasing a ballad when we should have released maybe another lousy day in paradise, boys go crazy, anything else. Or say you don't have a single yet, guys. Yes. But but releasing that to radio, it got respectability, but it was not a hit. And that was that. So I'm very, very heartbroken about that, by the way. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It would be so. Did you have a band meeting to say the quote Jim Morrison, this is the end? Yeah. And Bruce had issues still with Doug. They they did have conflict with each. Every, look, John and Paul fought, didn't they? Yes. And, and how did was, and how did Burton cope? Burton Burton Burton's a very complacent genius. Um, honestly, I mean, he I, I am his biggest champion as I am a Bruce Carey mm. because Burton endured it all. He co-wrote many songs with Doug. We were, you know, arranged some of the songs, uh, wrote lyrics, and and they were a great songwriting team. And, and Doug was a great front man, you know, especially early on, you know, before he got too stylized and dropped the acoustic, dropped the guitar and started doing a La Morrison out there with a leather jacket. That yeah. was in my my taste. But he's a performer, and I, I guess it was cool. It worked for a bit. But um, Burton, and again, for the solo, he came up with Sharona. And by the way, having the album come out first, everybody heard the long solo. And that got so many great critiques. When they cut this, as you had to make a, a 45 version, then they cut the solo. So all our TV shows, they cut, you know, was half of the solo. So I'm, I always champion Burton. I think he's unsung in terms of his, his technical skills. And that album, he really shows it off, yeah. by the way. Amazing. And even on the live album, we just did that Tequila Break On Through uh, jam we do. That solo is like Carlos Santana on steroids. It's brilliant. Mm. And, you know, I think this live album shows us, even with a different drummer and a different sound, I really think it shows that we still had that drive and spirit. And I'm very proud of that, by the way. So what happens for you personally between that period of the band breaking up and then the brand, band coming back together again? Well, it's interesting. I, it broke up. Now, I don't know if you know who this American singer is, Josie Cotton. Oh, no. Josie Cotton. Well, she was a new artist on Elektra. She had that underground hit be called Johnny Are You Queer, which is a big hit on K-Rock Radio in America, you know? Yes. And she was great looking. And I mean, she was really cool. So after that broke up, I joined her band. And believe it or not, in two months, I got on seven television shows <laughs> in America. How's that for weird? And we were in the movie Valley Girl, oh. which became a cult movie. Yes. So if you ever see that movie, I'm in the band playing with her Can and you... on the soundtrack. Jose, Josie Cotton. you ever see the movie? No. you ever see the movie? I haven't you seen it. You've got to go on YouTube and see the scene. Especially the last fight scene with Nicolas Cage and the other guy. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm playing bass with her. So we did an album after for Electra. She had a mild hit for uh, for uh, uh, the new big, you know, you, uh, the thing, you know, the new show for, why am I blanking on it? MTV, of course. MTV, get on MTV. What happens to and Jose, we, Josie? We missed, by the way, by the way, we missed MTV. We did videos for Sharona and, and Good Girls Don't. We mm. missed MTV for by a year, and that would have really launched us, by the way. You'd have, you'd have had a field day, wouldn't you? But they didn't have our video even. Oh. Play. So mm. Josie did, did chart. The album got good reviews, and it was mixed by Roy Thomas Baker, believe it or not. Good old Roy. But Roy that... was great. 
you don't stick with her or do you stick with her for the rest of the decade but when but a couple of years later you jam with George Harrison right oh so anyway I did the Josie thing for a while I played with some other groups you know I was still figuring out what I wanted to do myself Burden and Bruce were putting a new group together and we were using the lead singer who was an actor named Stephen Bauer Stephen was in Scarface oh yes you know, and a number of other heartthrob married to Melanie Griffith but we were with a manager who you said Steve wants to be a lead singer so we started putting a group together did some demos Steve did wasn't a great singer but sure looked good <laughs> <laughs> and we almost got a major record deal with Virgin but our manager got arrested for things you shouldn't be doing oh dear that's <laughs> exciting isn't it yes. but anyway so that that broke up and we were trying to put a new band together without Doug we ended up getting back together with Doug for uh, for a, a TV show, a benefit, and then that started that era of the knack, so to speak. Yes. And Bruce was still with us, but then Bruce quit, and that's when we did Serious Fun for Chris Charisma Records, and Don was produced that one, by the way. Yes. And Rocket of Love was an FM hit, by the way, whatever that means. It was a top ten FM hit. It was a good, really good song, by the way. Did a video, people never saw it because Charisma fell apart. And mm. that was that. So we, we broke up, got back together, did an album. We broke up. I'm just giving you the like, thing. We broke up again. Then we got back together. We, we played uh, some shows in L.A., Viper Room. We got a record deal from Rhino Records. Bruce had issues. And that's when we got Terry Bozier to drum with us, believe it or not. So mm. Terry Bozier was our drummer for Zoom. Blimey O'Reilly. There you go. The, the amazing man who'd worked with Frank Zappa. He was great and wish I had played them with Missing Persons, but, you know, he had broke up with Dale. So we, that album, Zoom, by the way, is a really good album. And we were writing together and Rhino Records put it out. By the way, there's a digital single from the new album called Harder on You, which is a song I wrote. Yay. Yes. <laughs> Finally got into the big time. You could. And I, that song was written... And I had Bill Hudson sing the, my demo from the Hudson Brothers, a great singer for that movie, That Thing You Do, but we submitted it too late. So I had the song and played it for Burton and Doug. They all loved it. I rewrote, uh, Burton helped me write a second bridge. I gave him a credit for it, which he yeah. deserves, of course. And I, I'm very grateful that that song is a digital single, by the way. Yes, I'm not surprised. So yes, George Harrison, 1960. Oh, I'm sorry. 1986, well, you, you have a uh, a jam with, with George. Well, the thing with George was remarkable because, uh, well, first I got a phone call from somebody saying somebody was going to call me about doing a session. So this producer called me and told me it's Sound City, you know, great recording studio, but I can't tell you who it is. I had no idea, you know, uh, what do I care who it is, right? So I went down there and I walk in the door and he goes, listen, by the way, it's for George Harrison. And I, I started to laugh. He goes, what are you laughing at? I said, I used to hang out with George at Tramps in London because I was dating somebody that was good friends with Derek Taylor's secretary. Oh. Derek Taylor was the publicist. Yes. George and the Beatles. So I used to dance with George like everybody did. You know, when you go out there, everybody danced together. And at that, it was during Intervision. And that, that came out, right? Right. So I said, George, and I said, I said man, Tramps, man. And he laughed. You know, I mentioned this girl's name. So, and he goes, yeah. And then he goes, yeah, man. He goes, uh, I heard with the knack, you know, good stuff. So at that moment, I felt, I knew George, didn't know him, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hold on a minute. I'm so sorry. Low mode. You there? Okay. Low yeah. power mode. But I'm okay. Real quick. Um, Because I knew it's, oh, I'm sorry. Damn it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Because I had met George, at least I felt, am I with you now or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're definitely with me. Okay. Because I had met George, it, it was an icebreaker for me. The fact yes. that it wasn't just somebody that met him on a dance floor, meaning that I met him and he knew my music. It, I was grateful yes. that I didn't have that, like, what am I going to do? So, um, he was really great in the studio. Jim Keltner was drumming, of course, the great Jim Keltner. And Jim Keltner was more laid back in the pocket. Great drummer. And then, of course, uh, Lawrence Struber was playing guitar, who played with McCartney. 
So it was like, wow, this is cool, you know? And so I got a chart written, a chart written for me to play. And George Harrison does not have normal chord changes. So I was a little nervous, uh, of course, and cutting in the control room with George, by the way, which is fascinating. And now you talk about pressure. Now I had a number one album. So it's not that I'm playing with George, but I'm playing, I'm reading a chart. Jim Kelton is not the drummer you want to rush. <laughs> and I didn't want them stopping the track going, oh, Prescott, you kind of rushed there. Or, I don't know about that note you played, right? Yes. So that, that confirmed my belief in God as I prayed because I got through it. I added some of my own bass lines and they didn't stop because of me. Fantastic. So, so that song I did was Someplace Else, which became the trailer for the movie Shanghai Surprise. Oh, that's Sean Penn, isn't it? Uh-huh. And that was the, the sad. I did another song. I did two days of work. I did have an invoice of me getting paid $340, by the way. I have a picture of the invoice to prove I didn't dream it, by the way. Ah, fantastic. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, so George went back to England. I was going to go over to record with him with the same producer. Unfortunately, unfortunately for George, he met Jeff Lynn, the genius Jeff Lynn, and, George, and Jeff Lynn made the greatest album, for, as you know, for George. Yes. And all those great songs, all those years ago, and they re-recorded someplace else, but that's okay. So I never got a chance to play with uh, George yeah. again. Jeez, but can't. I remember it dearly. When he passed away, it was it was just another, after he went through what he went through, by the way, you know, with his house being broken into and everything. Yes. It was just, so I miss him. Was, you know, geez, you know. It was it was quite horrendous. Yes. So then it comes up basically to what we're, Yes, the, then the band gets back together again, doesn't it? For this kind of the next yes. phase of the for the next your next phase, which is serious fun, and then it kind of goes to Zoom. So does the band settle down a bit and become a little bit more kind of less volatile? At well, this it was different. It was just different because again, we with Sharona coming out and being in that movie, Reality Bites. Yes. Luckily, we got a tour out of that. Now Tarantino wanted to use that in. Pulp Fiction, I believe. Did you know that story? No. They he approached uh, management at the time to use my Sharona first in that movie, but the scene he was going to use it for is that scene where Bruce Willis is raped by a bunch of yahoos. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't think that's a good song to be remembered in the movie like that. No. So in reality, by Ben Stiller wanted to use it, we said, yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes. And, and we got a tour. It was wonderful. We got a tour out of it, too. Yeah. And do you start enjoying being in the band a bit more at this stage rather than the, the initial sort of excitement? Well, obviously, that's amazing. Well, it was a family because it was basically me, me Burton and Doug. And we had different drummers, of course. And so it was the same family. A, a more mature family, a less controlled family, but you know it, it's at its. It, you know, you, when you have different opinions. You're going to have your quarrels, probably. Yeah. And I was married at the time, and I only wanted to act to. Doug got married a few times, but I had kids, which I'm grateful for because, again, I, you know, in terms of legacy, that's my legacy, and everything else is great. But this, you know, this is my life. So that was really cool that growing up, they shared that too, with the new albums, with the new thing, you know what I mean? So uh, it was cool. But, but anyway, so there were still issues, but we managed to keep it together. We did Zoom. We did uh, another album for Smile. We did a fake TV show. Looked like a TV show. It wasn't called Fun House. Yes. And, and then that album called uh, Tony, uh, Lens Tony from Smile, Valentino signed us. To a record, Valenciano signed this to Smile, and that's Normal is the Next Guy album, which led to the live at the House of Blues. Yes, and the, the House of Blues, this is just coming out next, well, no, this month, isn't it? Yeah, a couple of weeks. Which Three is weeks. Qu quite amazing. There's a track on it, which I think sounds amazing. Can I Borrow a Kiss? Great song. That's on Zoom. It's a great ballad. It's got a kind of a little, a little bit of Phil Spector-ish thing to it. The bass line, you know what I mean? It's yes. a great song, a great song. And, you know, Terry Bozio, people say, could never play with an act because he's so busy 
he's playing straight time the whole song. Yeah. <laughs> it's what it's kind of for me, it's one of the standout tracks on the album, actually. I just I, that... I agree. And that's a great song. And I also like Mr. Magazine, which nobody seems to know, but it's all about the news media and yeah. magazines. And it, it's a brilliant lyric Doug wrote. And again, I think that was a really cool album. And, and also on the last album, Normal, there's a song we did live called It's Not Me, which I think is one of my favorites as well. Yeah, I, I must admit, you know, I, th- I guess, you know, it's like anything that with the band, is it, it's, was it the case during that period that it just felt like because you'd sort of got married, having children and, and needing a bit more of a settled life, you just kept the sort of handle on the sort of emotional state of, of how it was kind of being run and how it was being managed? Well, you know, I mean, it's one thing to have friends for a long period of time, let alone friends and bandmates. I mean, I love Doug, of course, you know, like we all do in a marriage. It's good and bad, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, Burden, too. I still talk to Burden. He doesn't really want to perform anymore. He's, he's brilliant. Re- a great guy. He was writing musicals for the last few years. He's got immense talent, by the way. And I hope he succeeds. And, you know, I know Doug's sister, and she's involved now. And, you know, and his brother, Jeffrey, was a lawyer. And that's a whole nother story. But, you know, you, you can't dismiss it that when you're with somebody that long and play with them that long. It is your family. Yes. And, um, you know, a lot of the ego things kind of disappear. I mean, the fact we got to that point. Bruce had issues and we tried to play with him earlier on, but in 2006, he passed away. He had uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which he didn't address. Doug, at the same time, realized he had some, some tumors in his head. And luckily, he was able to fight the cancer. And we did a lot of shows. And un- unfortunately, in the end, he couldn't do any more than he did to try to stop it. So that was very hard heart-wrenching for me of course yeah you know, i love the guy and to see him fight for his life for a few years was just unbelievable yeah, and totally now cool. of course and then after that of course i'm the the living member of the knack and burden it's like well, what the hell's that about or the surviving member you know i never know what it's like to lose a member now i do and a lot of what just went on with dave Gruel's. Dave Grohl was a big Knack fan, by the way, and I, I know him. To lose Taylor, a lifelong friend and great drummer, it's devastating. Yes. And you, you can't, there's been a lot of that going on this last year and two years or three years ago, you know? It's, yes. it's Chris Squire broke my heart. I love Chris Squire. And Absolutely. I was a big Yes fan, by the way. Yes, and, well, um, we loved our prog rock during that period. So does that mean that you, well, how did you survive the last couple of years of lockdown? Did that, did you sort of start some projects and and navigate that well i well between the earlier years you mentioned i had a gift for teaching i teach you know guitar bass drums and piano i I could play them all so i got a lot more students and i was good at it so i got to teach in a lot of people's homes when i lived in malibu i was teaching mel gibson's kids uh which was very and he had seven of them i taught three of them teach marins So uh, I taught a lot of different people's children in Beverly Hills. You know, I met people that knew people. And it was a real, it's kind of interesting to teach in their homes because you get a better idea of how the family works. (laughs) Must be a bit distracting, actually. No, it was great because nobody wants to bring their kids to a studio to have lessons. So the fact that I went to their homes, it was great. And some of these kids formed bands with their friends in the neighborhood who I kind of organized to do shows at bar mitzvahs, maybe. Yes. So it was, it was something I liked doing for a while and jamming and teaching ki- musician kids how to jam, not just play, you know, parts of a song. And blues was a great way to teach kids how to solo over three chords and teach them how to phrase, teach them how to make up stuff. And a lot of music today is not some doesn't have as much as that going on. Yeah, absolutely. And did you and your kids have also sort of all formed a band as well, haven't they? Yeah, they um, the name Gateway Drugs is dubious, but it uh, comes from Aldous Huxley, you can say, okay? Yes. <laughs> like Doors of Perception. But they uh, did two albums. The last album they did, uh, my, my three kids, Livia, Gabe, and Noah, and the band, they had a fourth member. And they did tour off their first album. Unfortunately, they did their second album, and uh, because of the lockdown, they couldn't tour. And there are YouTube clips of it. They shot the video clips of themselves 
uh, Gateway Drugs is one called Revolution. There's one called uh, The Weight, and another called Slumber. People can look it up. Yeah, they're, they're really, really talented. There's three different vocalists too. And are they sticking with the band? Is that still going to be happening? Yeah, they're going to be. They're writing different material. My daughter has actually thought she might do a solo album because she has different music ideas. And in other words, it's all about growth. And and during this lockdown was devastating. I did. I did work for a company called Taxi Music, where what they do is they, they collect material for movies, soundtracks. They also have songwriters send in their songs to be critiqued by people in the business to help them be better songwriters, by the way. Yes. And that's a real, real, a real luxury or a great thing for me to be like a mentor of people I don't know, but writing critiques about their songwriting. And, you know, they have conventions and some songs get forwarded for commercials or movie soundtracks. So I was doing that remotely, which helped pay the bills. Yes. And nobody wanted to play live. So it was very difficult to to uh, get through it, let alone was devastating. You know, I was around during the AIDS thing, too, by the way. Mm. And there was misinformation. But I promise you, if somebody offered a vaccine that nobody knew if it would work, everybody would have taken. Yes. Because that was really frightful time period Horrendous. and uh, scary as hell. So, you know, I only equate the two, pa- this pandemic. And it's different because back then, unless you shot needles or slept with, kiss somebody, allegedly, whatever. Now it's like you can hurt somebody by not getting vaccinated or by not keeping. It's very strange to have a codependent society never existed in my life and i had to get used to that and understand the, the depth of it that i'm responsible for your health and mm-hmm. i was strange i i took the vaccine i know i couldn't work if i didn't and it's okay my kids wanted me to take it because they didn't want me to be in a hospital so i had my own reasons i didn't get on the the, the bandwagon of not me brother Barry Clem didn't want to do it i respect him i'm not going to call him a killer and say he's trash, you know? I, I hated that, by the way. Yeah. Eric Clavin became a meme and, and a nothing because mm-hmm. of people's, like, that's what, you know, as you know, social media has become that. Yes. So it's, um, it's dreadful, actually. It's a, it's a mean place. Yeah, I just, I mean, I've, I'm a lifelong asthmatic, so the one thing I don't want is something that I know what it's like not to be able to breathe. And, um, I, and I, but I know people that can't take the vaccine because they're allergic to it. Yeah, well, so that's, I'm, that, yeah. And, and, and it's just a dread. I'm glad we're at a better place. And again, I'm, I couldn't be happier that at this point in my life and this history of opening up that our album's coming out. Yes, this and is everybody's true. opening up, and that's a miracle. I don't have to sign autographs for people in masks. I know, or try and understand what they're talking about. So does that mean that you're going to hold the baton for the NAC? Yeah, and, and to, I am. to try and take it forward to the next, you know. Well, I'm going to have my own perspective on it. I got my own perspective on it. Uh, I'm going to do a signing there. I don't know if Bird wants to come, you know, for other issues. But, I'm, you know, to me, I, I, it's like a gift to be able to talk about the NAC, have a new album out which mm. I didn't know was going to happen. You know, maybe technically it's not a perfect album, recording the way it's off the board, et cetera. But people like it. And I get to talk about Doug and Bruce. And, you know, even though David Jones is a great drummer, it's still the legacy of the Knack. So I'm grateful for the opportunity and to see people come to Amoeba without masks and, and want to express their gratitude and joy. I think it's terrific. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to a lot of different people. Yes, so I'm, absolutely. I'm extremely grateful. And I'm also playing uh, yes, with missing persons again. We're doing shows. We're seeing people's faces. About, we're doing a big uh, concert called uh, Cruel World Tour. It, it's two shows. Uh, Morrissey's headlining. I mean, Blondie, Devo, Berlin, hundreds of bands playing. So missing persons are playing both days. And that's going to be, it was postponed twice, but this is going to be awesome, man. Fantastic. I love the Smiths and Morrissey back in the Yeah, 90s. and then a lot of violent femmes. I mean, you, psychedelic furs, English beat. You got to look at the, uh, uh, you know, thing for it, the advertising. It's fantastic. Yeah. So again, I'll be able to talk about the knack too. That will be very it's exciting. In, it's in May. 
because we have something new out. So I'm grateful for Liberation and grateful for Tony. <laughs> they made it. Po- I mean, I really am because I wouldn't be talking to you. Yes, absolutely. And Miss in Perth. So, so will you be looking at playing some live dates as you and the Knack? at all well i've been asked that many i just the other day somebody called me up marcy an agency i i don't know without burden i feel funny about it and i I could do it and let's just say that unless i really understand what i'm doing or how i'm going to do it it'll only do to be honored to us as a group when i wish burden would do it it'd be a lot easier to do it and there's different angles i'm like different celebrities maybe playing with us to not make it like a new knack which it isn't a new knack Yes. Oh, damn it. I'm Never. sorry. Hold on a minute. That's okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm closing. It's a low power mode. You oh, good? Yeah. yeah, that's fine. So I know the, we're wrapping now anyway. Oh, yeah. Then. So just, okay, because it's um getting late. Yeah, so look, just one que- one last kind of question. If you could have said something to your 16, 18-year-old self starting out back in that yeah. room. I mean, is there a couple of things you would have just whispered in their ear, even if they would have just said, oh, I don't care? I don't want to listen to you. But, you oh, know, back it, to today's children, in other words? Well, or possibly even your younger self. I mean, you know, I'm just, I don't want to get too complicated. But I suppose it's like, have you got any kind of a couple of bullet point, bullet point and things? Yeah, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this. Look, getting a record deal for a rock band, even in the 60s, was a gamble too. Yes. It, people weren't giving out money. And if they did, you better have success or they dropped you in a heartbeat. You know, money. Yeah. So when people idealize the past, you you can't you you go yeah there were risks today they're screaming and artists are getting ripped off, but that's a terrible thing. However, back then even to get an album deal was a miracle. Um, I was lucky to, to be around, being sixteen seventeen to have met Velvet to at least know what the music business looked like. And yeah. to me, the biggest hook was playing music. I didn't know I had an ability, let alone loved music as much as I did and basically by playing and jamming with people and having social intercourse and and and, and that's a word that's proper by the way I know. Means, but now it's god knows what it is god um is. but having the ability not to talk zoom is great but sitting in a room with people and jamming music is not like jamming in zoom with four people and four screens yes there's an intangible of that i've done it and it's not the same but I mean, I followed whatever my dream was. I, yeah, I got to places without money. I moved to places like California. I had no money. I flew to Boston. I was lucky. Maybe other people had greater success than me. They did it a different way. But I think uh, my passion and my desire not to be a star, but just to be part of that scene was, I think, because everybody who is, who's a star, Hendrix with Cream. I love Cream. I love. Led Zeppelin, I love the Who. They're all stars. Yes. It was about a group thing, not just being a, a like a guy who was a soloist. Yes. You know, so that was part of my thing. And I think that's the advice. I mean, you got to do what you got to do in each culture, but write the songs you want to write, get your own sound and, and try to be as original as you can. And also, you know, be critical of what you're doing and also play a lot. The Knack didn't get as good as we did. We written written the songs we wrote. If we didn't do a hundred shows, yes, this is true. Playing and that's live. by the way, that's what the police did. I heard an interview the other day. They played everywhere. That was Miles, you know, Copeland's idea before the record came. And by the way, we opened for the police in '78, which was fabulous. Yeah. We didn't have our album out then, but it was great. I love. I mean, Sting, <laughs> God bless him, and the, what a great group they were. They are. They are. You know. Well, Miles, Miles, I did an interview with Miles Copeland, who said that the most important gig they played was in America when, because his brother was an agent, and they played in front of I, four, I know. and they played in front of four people, or possibly five, but one of them was yep. an, an important music person who gave them that kind of gateway to the next level. So he said, you, you know, you do have to play. Oh, um, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something fast. When we played London, that's when the punk thing sort of came out, was happening, 78, 79. So we, we played the Aylesbury Club, Friars Club in mm. Aylesbury. We didn't know what it was to be thrown shillings with Nicks in them while we were performing. We were spit on, scenes were thrown at us. We survived and got through the whole set and got applause. We played the uh, speak, uh, we played a uh, marquee club right after England lost to Scotland in soccer. 
Right. Do a lot of crazy F- MFs throwing shit at us on stage, going, screw you, Doug, and they spit in his face. And Doug jumped into the audience, man. We got through the whole set and got applause. Those are real points of, if you can get through that, you, you got gumption, okay? Yes. So we had to duck a lot of coins thrown at us in London. You know what that's like? Those could kill you. I know. Lemmy got very annoyed with that, actually, from Motorhead. So that's one of the be- that's one of the proving grounds for the knack, by the way, to yes. get through that. And, and I, I'm grateful we did, because I could have been a casualty. <laughs> well, look, Prescott, thank you ever so much for this. But I'm going to, um, yes, I think I've got quite a lot there now. But um, and also, I'm going to go to bed. Okay, that's a massive thanks to Prescott for giving me the time of that interview. Hopefully you've got everything you need there and much, much more. There you go. So The Knack, they have got a new album that's coming out, a 2001 concert live at the House of Blues, recorded at Hollywood. 18 tracks and some fine material. Anyway, this is the C86 Show. I'm David East, so if you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86 Show. And all these have been archived, aren't you lucky? Uh, You can find those on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean. Check them out. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.